Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's set online webinar. My name is Shraddha Menon, and before we get started with today's session, we would like to thank our sponsorship from IAS, which allows us to offer all these resources free of charge. Make sure and check out our website for more info on upcoming events and meetings and to see everything available for the community. Today's talk is by Sitska Battenberg, uh, who's a professor from the University of Barcelona. She completed her bachelor's degree at the Utrecht University in the Netherlands. She then received a PhD from Naples and Portsmouth, UK, focusing on the orbital phasing of Maastrichtian climate integrated stratigraphy. She did her postdoc in Frankfurt, Oxford, and Wren. She was also a Marie Curie Research Fellow looking at the role of oceanography and orbital forcing on past greenhouse climates in high southern latitudes at the University de Ren, France. She's also participated in IODP Expeditions 369 and is part of the planned Expedition 392, which I think is very interesting. Uh, her research interests include oceanography and past greenhouse climates, particularly in the late Cretaceous and Eocene, and this is what she will be discussing today. And with this short introduction, I would like to pass over the mic to Sitska. If you're ready, you can take it. Thank you very much, Radra, and thank you very much for the invitation to give a, to give a webinar for SEDS Online. Um, I chose a very grand title, Roles of Oceanography and Orbital Forcing in Greenhouse Climates. Now in this talk, I won't be able to solve all the uh, outstanding research questions, but I would like to show you some results from case studies um, that I've worked on. Uh, and the results that I'll be showing there have been generated at different uh, institutions um, and, and organizations that are listed below. Uh, and as Shradra said, I'm currently based at the University of Barcelona, where I've just started as a lecturer. Um, so the outline of my seminar, I have to be honest, it's going to be uh, jumping back and forth a lot between uh, ocean circulation, orbital forcing, but I hope to touch on all of these topics. And what will unite uh, my talk, uh, hopefully, uh, is that it will be on specifically on greenhouse climates. Uh, and specifically on the greenhouse climates of the Eocene and the late Cretaceous. Uh, and the reason for that um, is in this figure. Uh, this is a figure of CO2 uh, uh, data, uh, a compilation based uh, on the left-hand side on proxy data. Then uh, time steps become smaller towards the right uh, and CO2 is measured directly in ice cores. Then we have historical measurements and finally predictions of what CO2 levels might be in the atmosphere in the future. And if we look at those scenarios for future uh, CO2 emissions uh, into the atmosphere, then we see that uh, we're predicted uh, to really reach very high CO2 levels. This year we've already surpassed 420 ppm CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, and to understand uh, what climate might look like with CO2 levels uh, at the end of the century, we have to go very far back uh, into uh, the geological record, at least as far back as the Eocene at about 50 million years ago, but perhaps as far back as the late Cretaceous um, hothouse conditions. Um, this is uh, another figure uh, summarizing uh, climate through time. This is a uh, record of oxygen isotope data uh, from foraminifera from the southern high latitudes in particular, uh, with the oxygen isotope scale on the top and the temperature scale on the bottom. Uh, and this is for the Cretaceous uh, and the early Cenozoic. And what we see is that we go from an extreme uh, hothouse state uh, with overall cooling, but again, uh, greenhouse conditions in the Eocene. And the first interval that I'd like to discuss is actually a relatively cool interval uh, at the very end of the Cretaceous, but still warmer than the present day. Now, what did the world look like at the end of the Cretaceous? Um, there were very high sea levels, and that was in part due to the very high temperatures, but also because spreading rates had been relatively high throughout the Mesozoic, so that there was relatively young oceanic crust that was pushing uh, the seawater up. Um, the geography was very different with the Atlantic Ocean opening, uh, and a, a very uh, big difference in terms of oceanography was that there was an ocean connection uh, across uh, uh, longitudes. 
So we had the Tethys Ocean connected to the Proto-North Atlantic and connected to the Pacific Ocean with a circum-equatorial current. And this sh relatively shallow connection uh, is something that we didn't see anymore after the Cretaceous. When I started working on, on the end of the Cretaceous, I started working on the Zumaya section in northern Spain. Uh, and the reason for that was we wanted to improve the geologic time scale. And the Zumaya section we thought would be a, a good candidate section for this because when we look at the succession, we see an alternation of limestones and marls. And these alternations are very rhythmic. Uh, and if you look at the individual alternations, especially at the marls, you can see that sometimes they are much darker and more deeply weathered. And sometimes they are hardly distinguishable from the uh, surrounding limestones. And these types of patterns are what we call hierarchical stacking patterns. Here we can see, we think we can see the influence of different orbital periodicities that have uh, worked on our climate, on the amount of energy that we have received from the sun. So what you see on the picture is a field interpretation. We then collected very high resolution uh, samples and measured uh, color reflectance, magnetic susceptibility to then perform time series analysis to test our field interpretation. And once we had a solid cyclostratigraphic framework, we had proof uh, together with independent age control that these periodicities were indeed linked to the orbital periodicities. We were able to use those periodicities to improve, to refine the geologic time scale. And these types of age models are now the backbone for paleoclimate studies. And what we saw in particular, uh, and what we see in the late Cretaceous, we mostly see um, sedimentary records that uh, show this rhythmic behavior. They often show the influence of eccentricity modulated precession. And just as a quick reminder, sorry. precession is what determines our seasonal contrast. So it determines whether we have very uh, mild summers and winters or whether we have uh, an extreme, extremely high seasonal contrast or an extremely low seasonal contrast. It affects all the latitudes and the effect of eccentricity is modulated by eccentricity so that when eccentricity is high, precession has a higher amplitude. And this is something we recognize in a lot of uh, Cretaceous, Cretaceous rhythmic successions uh, and seems to be very typical for greenhouse worlds in which there is relatively little ice. Uh, something that we see much less in the Cretaceous is the influence of obliquity. Uh, obliquity is the tilt of the Earth's axis and has its strongest influence on climate at the, uh, in the polar regions, uh, influencing the amount of energy that is received there. Um, it mostly has an effect on the very high latitudes, uh, but we're seeing more and more that the effects of obliquity can also be found in the lower latitudes uh, through uh, latitudinal connections. And that is something that we've observed in a, in a core, uh, which was in the uh, Mississippi uh, embayment, the Shukolak core, which, uh, which was deposited at a paleo latitude of 35 degrees north. Um, so this uh, Core recovered sediments deposited at relatively low latitudes, but in this core we see the combined influence of eccentricity and obliquity. Um, and you can see the uh, calcium carbonate concentrations here in purple, a bandpass filter of what we think is the 405 kilo year eccentricity cycle. And then we think that the shorter scale variations are linked to variations in obliquity. So we are still puzzling over what exactly is causing uh, these obliquity driven cycles uh, in these sediments at such a low latitude. And we are wondering if there is a connection over the North American continent, such as a temperature gradient that might be driving uh, this, this obliquity forcing. In the meantime, we are able to use the uh, long eccentricity cycle uh, to perform astronomical tuning. Uh, and that is something that we've uh, done. Uh, it's uh, this record in black of the Shukola core, and it's the first record that covers uh, so much of the Campanian in one continuous uh, section. 
And this is really what we're after when we're aiming to improve the geological time scale for the Cretaceous. The challenge for us is now to really cover all of the intervals and to be able to correlate between uh, the different psychostratigraphic interpretations. So now that we have more and more of these uh, psychostratigraphically uh, constrained age models, uh, we can start uh, looking at what was happening with Earth's climate at the time. Uh, this is a compilation of uh, car bulk carbon isotope data uh, for the end of the Cretaceous from different sites, where the data from Sumaya have their own psychostratigraphic age model and the data from site U1403 also have their own uh, psychostratigraphic age model. And because they're on independent age models, we can now evaluate which parts of the carbon isotope curve have been responding to global processes and which parts have been mostly uh, influenced by local processes influencing the, the carbon isotope curve at that location. And hopefully this way we can learn something about uh, what was happening with the global carbon cycle. And one feature of these curves that they all uh, seem to share is that at the very end of the Cretaceous there is an oscillation in carbon isotopes, which is the expression of the late Maastrichtian warming event. Uh, and this is the, uh, how we uh, recognize this event uh, in uh, sediments from site U1403 near Newfoundland, is that we see uh, some very dark bands in the last 400 kilo year cycle of the Cretaceous. So in the last 400,000 years of the Cretaceous, we see that the bending in the sediments really changes from relatively gradual color variations to really these very prominent dark bands that are very rich in iron. Uh, and we think that this uh, banding pattern is related to uh, precessional forcing and that it might reflect that the amplitude of precession uh, was high at the time in an eccentricity maximum, but also that the uh, sedimentation at this locality was more sensitive to this type of forcing at the time. Uh, and that feeds into the debate about the end of the Cretaceous, uh, the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary, uh, where we had a mass extinction, one of the biggest five mass extinctions in Earth history, uh, which is of course famous for the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs. Uh, and there's ongoing debate about the roles of volcanism and the impact of an asteroid. So there was large scale volcanism at the Deccan Traps uh, in India, and there was an impact at the Chicxulub crater in the Yucatan Peninsula uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. So the question uh, that many people are still uh, working on is uh, on the relative timing of different processes that operated at that time. So when exactly what were there pulses of volcanic activity? When exactly was the impact of the asteroid? Uh, was there already uh, a stressed uh, environment before the impact uh, that may have uh, uh, made the world more susceptible uh, to such a, an extinction or not. Uh, and this is uh, something that people are working on from different angles. Uh, people are working on improving the dating of the phases of volcanic activity uh, of the Deccan traps by uranium lead dating uh, in this uh, left hand figure and argon argon dating in this recent study in this right hand figure. Um, but they show very different um, ages, uh, although both techniques have, have uh, seen a major improvement uh, over recent years uh, and have reached a much higher precision. But so far the uranium lead dating seems to suggest uh, a lot of uh, volcanic activity just before the KT boundary, with time getting younger towards the left. Uh, whereas the argon-argon dating suggests uh, that the volume of uh, lava extruded, so that's represented in these colored blocks, was actually higher after the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. Uh, and this is also somewhat related to uh, where they place the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary uh, in these sequences. So what we can add from a paleoclimate perspective is we can generate very high resolution data of what climate was like uh, at the end of the Cretaceous and in the uh, early Paleogene and how it responded to uh, these different processes, 
to the volcanic activity and to the impact of the asteroid. And this study is a very large compilation of uh, available uh, temperature data from proxy records, uh, from a range of proxy records. Uh, and if you follow the red line, which represents the average of all those uh, data, we can see that uh, time uh, on this figure is now going from old to young on the right. We can see that throughout the end of the Cretaceous in the last four, 300,000 years, we see this warming and then cooling. So this is the late Maastrichtian warming event. And we see that uh, average temperatures were actually uh, back to relatively normal background levels just before the impact uh, at the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. And then this is compared with different scenarios of uh, volcanic activity. Uh, and just based on these uh, temperature proxies, uh, we suggested that the main phases of uh, volcanic emissions would have been uh, much before the extinction, about 300 uh, kilo year before the extinction, and not having so much of an influence uh, at the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary itself. Um, this seems to contrast uh, results from mercury. Uh, mercury concentrations uh, in marine sediments have been used as a proxy for um, subaerial volcanism. Uh, and this, these are again studies at the Zumaya section in uh, northern Spain, uh, in the Basque country. Uh, and we see peaks in mercury just before the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. And this has been interpreted to reflect uh, a phase of volcanic activity. Uh, but then uh, I was involved in another study where we extended the record further down and we found similar peaks uh, in mercury uh, further down with a cyclic uh, nature, uh, suggesting that the mercury is uh, perhaps not directly uh, derived from the volcanism or well, perhaps there is more mercury in the system, but it only arrives at this setting uh, as a perhaps related to, to runoff, uh, to the trital inputs to the basin. Um, I'm very lucky to work with uh, Vicente Gilabet, who is a PhD student at the University of Zaragoza and is uh, just writing up uh, the last bits of his uh, thesis. Uh, and he's been working on planktonic foraminifera, uh, on their assemblages and on their morphologies, uh, together with uh, data measured uh, directly uh, on the carbonate, uh, the concentration of carbonate and the bulk carbonate stable isotope records. Uh, and he is focused on the end of the Cretaceous and the very early Paleogene. And this is an example of his interpretation of the late Maastrichtian warming event where he thinks based on the changes in assemblages and in the morphologies of planktic foraminifera, that there's a temporary change in the structure of the water column. But again, that conditions return to fairly normal after the late Maastrichtian warming event. Now, Vicente has applied this uh, technique to Thumaya, uh, where he analyzed the planktic foraminifera in great detail and was able to uh, get a very refined biostratigraphic interpretation. And then we work together to interpret the lithological cyclicity, um, which uh, uh, had been done by several authors before. Uh, and we tried to bring those interpretations uh, into agreement, uh, especially just above the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. And those interpretations of the cyclicity uh, are our age model, and they give us very detailed uh, age control on the timing of paleoenvironmental and paleoclimate change. Uh, and this uh, is the result uh, of that study, uh, which has been published in Geology just last month, uh, where we can see uh, different uh, carbon isotope records uh, on their own age models. In this green turquoise color is the carbon isotope record from Zumaya, compared to other localities worldwide. And in the carbon isotope record, we can recognize the gradual uh, oscillation related to the late Maastrichtian warming event. Uh, you can also compare it on the very right hand side of the figure uh, with the compilation of temperature data from the Hallett al paper. 
Uh, so you see that uh, values uh, change but return to fairly normal just before the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. And then another event that we can recognize uh, in the record is the so-called Dan C2 event, which is thought to be uh, perhaps a hyperthermal event uh, with a characteristic uh, double peak. So we see that in the Sumaya section and in other sections worldwide. Now, when we look at the timing of these events compared to uh, volcanic activity, which is indicated uh, in yellow uh, and red for the, uh, based on the Argon-Argon study we saw before and the Uranium-Lead study that we saw before, uh, we, can, uh, we can see that the late Maastrichtian warming event doesn't seem to coincide with a major pulse in volcanic activity and neither does the Dan C2 event. Now, this doesn't mean that volcanic activity did not have any influence on climate, but uh, we hypothesize that perhaps uh, the CO2 that was uh, put into the atmosphere through volcanism only had a, a strong impact on climate when orbital forcing was also reaching an extreme, in this case, extreme uh, eccentricity during eccentricity maxima that the precessional amplitude was larger so that it could lead more to more climatic uh, perturbation. Um, so here we've linked the changes uh, in climate to mostly to the timing of them, mostly to orbital changes, although the background mechanism might be the output of CO2 through volcanism. So this is a very detailed look at the Cretaceous uh, Paleogene boundary. Um, and now I'd like to take a step back and look at a very uh, large time scale across the late Cretaceous and into the early Paleogene into uh, what changed uh, in the configuration of the, of the continents and what that meant for changes in ocean circulation. So at the very end of the Cretaceous, the Atlantic Ocean is gradually opening and is still relatively narrow. There are um, barriers and sills at depth that might still block the flow of deep waters uh, and gateways uh, are opening. Um, so the way we study uh, ocean circulation in, these, in this time period uh, is mostly by the generation of neodymium isotope records. Uh, and the way that works is that uh, neodymium is delivered uh, to the ocean from the continents where old cratons typically have very negative values and young volcanic material has higher neodymium isotope ratios. Material gets delivered to the oceans, uh, dissolved in rivers, but also in dust particles. And this imprints the neodymium inventory of the surface waters. And these surface waters, if they increase in density and sink to depth to form deep water masses, they carry their neodymium isotope signature with them to depth. And as they are flowing over the sea floor, where they touch the sediment, this neodymium isotope ratio can be incorporated into different archives. And the archives we commonly use are phosphatic fish debris and also the ferromanganese oxide coatings that form around grains. So we uh, try to purify the neodymium uh, from those archives. Uh, we do that in a laboratory that is completely free of metals. So basically everything is made of Teflon and plastic. Uh, we do uh, column chemistry. Uh, and when we have mostly, uh, when we almost only have neodymium left in our samples, we can measure the ratio between the different isotopes with multi-collector uh, mass spectrometry. And this is what we did for the, uh, a range of sites at the end of the Cretaceous uh, and into the Paleogene. So we mostly had sites uh, in this, on this barrier system of the Rio Grande Rise Wolfus Ridge that formed the barrier for the flow of deep waters for a very long time in the Cretaceous. Um, so you can see the red curve is from the top of Rio Grande Rise, whereas the yellow curve is from more or less the top of the Wolfus Ridge. And this is compared to other data sets, uh, available data from Demerara Rice in the Equatorial Atlantic, and also from a data set that we've generated, uh, again from site U1403 uh, off the coast of Newfoundland uh, in the North Atlantic. Uh, 
And what we see when we look at these data is that in the, at the end of the Cretaceous, there is a very large spread in data, uh, very different uh, neodymium isotope values. And gradually throughout the end of the Cretaceous and into the Cenozoic, these values start to follow similar trends uh, and start to lie more closely uh, together. And at about 59 million years ago, they fall within a relatively narrow range. So we see a convergence of these neodymium isotope values. Um, and we interpret that as maybe um, an intensification of deep water exchange. Maybe deep waters were gradually able to flow over this barrier system more and more. Uh, and they were able to fill uh, the basins of the Atlantic uh, um, flowing more quickly uh, and mixing uh, more readily. Uh, so that the Atlantic Ocean, both the South and North Atlantic, really become part of the global thermohaline circulation. Uh, and interestingly, this time of about 59 million years ago is a time when, when we look at uh, benthic foraminiferal isotope records, we see a long-term uh, change from a cooling trend, we see a shift to, to a warming trend. Uh, and this is when we head into the Eocene greenhouse. So perhaps this more efficient uh, thermohaline circulation may have contributed to the background conditions uh, that led to the world to get into another greenhouse state uh, in the Eocene. Um, so when thinking about that circulation going from the Cretaceous into the Eocene, it seems that that submarine barrier had a large influence uh, on what was possible for the circulation uh, of ocean waters. So in that case, um, ocean circulation may have been controlled by the paleogeography. Uh, but we also think that parts of ocean circulation are controlled by climate, that climate and especially temperature might control where deep water masses are able to form. Um, so how do we disentangle climatic and geographic controls uh, on deep ocean circulation? And this is something that um, I've started working on uh, in France and that I'd like to uh, continue to work on. Uh, and I'm uh, working on the comparison of, of two very different scenarios. One is in the middle Cretaceous, uh, and I'll have more slides uh, on that after. But the, what I will discuss first is the uh, opening of Eocene gateways. So in, in that scenario, we are mostly looking at uh, changes in uh, paleogeography. Whereas for the Cretaceous scenario, we'll be looking at an abrupt climatic perturbation. So in the EU scene, uh, the world experienced the opening of gateways, uh, the continents uh, around Antarctica separated. So Australia, uh, separated from Antarctica and also South America, with the opening of the Tasman Gateway and the Drake Passage. Uh, the numbers that I've written here are, are a very wide range of numbers. Uh, for both these passages, uh, the first indications of a shallow opening are at about 50 million years ago. Uh, and the latter number, the second number, is when we see evidence for a deep uh, connection through these gateways. So when exactly we consider these gateways to be open, uh, it is very uh, poorly constrained. And this is uh, on the left-hand side, this is a modeling study, uh, modeling the effect of opening the Drake Passage. Uh, and we see that uh, opening the Drake Passage between South America and Antarctica actually influences very large scale ocean circulation patterns. Uh, also for waters flowing perhaps south of Australia in a proto-Antarctic circumpolar current. Uh, I was very lucky to participate in uh, IUDP ex Expedition 369, uh, southwest of Australia, where we recovered sediments that should lie under the flow path of this proto-Antarctic circumpolar current. Um, and this is what those uh, sediments looked like. So uh, I was very excited when these sediments uh, came on board uh, because they're very, very beautifully cyclic. Um, but in a poor photograph like this, I think you can hardly see that. So if we uh, attach all those sections and compress the photograph, uh, 
I hope you can see that there are very nice bending patterns. And if we then increase the contrast, perhaps these bending patterns become easier to see. Uh, and we might start uh, to think about a potential interpretation in terms of orbital forcing. Uh, now, this is, of course, something uh, that we have to uh, test, that we have to uh, analyze by generating a lot of data. And we've performed uh, XRF core scanning, giving us, giving us lots of records uh, of elemental concentrations in these sediments. Uh, and in this manuscript led by uh, Max Wallenkamp, uh, we were able to show that uh, the sedimentation uh, at this site was very strongly controlled by orbital forcing, in particular by the combined influence of eccentricity and obliquity. Uh, so here you can see the eccentricity and obliquity plotted together with the calcium iron ratio obtained through XRF core scanning, and they show very similar patterns. And this uh, uh, Analysis proved particularly useful because we were able uh, to, uh, to get a cyclostratigraphic framework for the Middle Eocene. And the Middle Eocene, had, for a long time, had been a, um, a heavily discussed uh, part of the geologic timescale uh, with very different uh, interpretations, mostly through a lack of continuous cyclic successions. So here we were able to close that Middle Eocene gap. Um, so now back to climate and to uh, oceanography. Um, the opening of the gateways around Antarctica has uh, traditionally been seen as one of the factors uh, driving uh, cooling because it may have isolated the Antarctic continent uh, with the uh, onset of this uh, circumpolar current uh, and that may have led to the glaciation of Antarctica. But uh, the more we learn from different records, the more complex this picture becomes. And it seems that the opening of gateways is, is not related one-on-one -on -one with the onset of, uh, of ocean currents uh, or with Antarctic glaciation. So there are now neodymium isotope data available from a range of sites uh, that are indicated uh, on this map. And I've shown uh, on the right-hand side one such example uh, which is actually the only uh, uh, record that I, I think I understand, um, the behavior of the neodymium isotopes. Because um, what happens here is that uh, at this site uh, on Kerguelen, uh, when glaciation starts on Antarctica, neodymium isotopes shift to more negative values, which can be a consequence of erosion and weathering inputs. And then afterwards, neodymium values return to normal when this uh, initial pulse is finished. Now we have a record uh, from southwest of, of Australia and we hope that we might be able to see uh, a change in circulation perhaps from east to west to a circulation that is predominantly from west to east. So we're working on generating neodymium isotope values uh, over the Eocene and over the Eocene Oligocene transition. Um, and this is what the Eocene Oligocene transition uh, looks like at site uh, U1514. Um, I've plotted the isotope data uh, very vague because they're not published yet, but we think that in the bulk isotope data we see a two step uh, change, which, it, which is typical for the Eocene Oligocene transition. Uh, and what we have uh, as well is a very detailed biostratigraphy and a very good magnetostratigraphy uh, for this site. And also, uh, preliminary analysis of the banding patterns suggests that there might be uh, an imprint of orbital forcing. And we hope that we might be able to use this imprint uh, to get a detailed age model. So we're currently working uh, on generating neodymium isotope data from that locality. And then we want to combine uh, those uh, data with data from other uh, Southern Hemisphere sites. Uh, I'm particularly excited to join on Expedition 392 to the Agulas Plateau. So this is uh, plotted uh, for an Eocene uh, paleogeography. And now I want to jump to the mid-Cretaceous, where you can see that the geography was very different uh, with the continents around Antarctica much closer together. And in that mid-Cretaceous period, um, there was an abrupt climatic perturbation called Oceanic Anoxic Event 2, uh, when we see uh, in different ocean basins uh, that there was a sudden lack of 
oxygen in the water column. Uh, and at this site, site view 1516, uh, southwest of Australia, we see the expression of that oceanic anoxic event in the sediments as a series of very dark bands that are very rich in organic matter. Um, and it's a very different expression from uh, what I was used to from oceanic anoxic event two, uh, because uh, I had seen it previously uh, in Italian successions uh, so from the Tethys and the, and the Proto North Atlantic. And in particular here at Furlo, we see a change from uh, carbonate sedimentation to the sudden deposition of a very thick black shale interval uh, of more than a meter. And then again, uh, carbonate sedimentation. Um, and we used uh, the sedimentation patterns at this site at Furlo to investigate the potential imprint of uh, orbital forcing uh, because we saw uh, banding patterns with uh, lots of layers of uh, chirps. And we, were, uh, we collected high resolution data, performed time series analysis, and we think that the exact timing of the deposition of these uh, black shales is related to a very long periodicity uh, in Earth's orbital parameters in the 2.4 million year cycle of eccentricity. And during such a, an eccentricity minimum, such a long-term eccentricity minimum, seasonal extremes are avoided for a very long period of time. So seasonality is very stable. And we think that when seasonality was introduced again, uh, that that is when uh, we see the sudden deposition uh, of black shales. So in this case, we suspect that orbital uh, forcing may have uh, determined the exact timing uh, of this event, but we don't think it was necessarily the driving factor because at the same time, there is a lot of volcanism uh, that may have provided the nutrients uh, for increased productivity. And that may have been the driver of this very large scale uh, anoxia uh, on longer time scales. Um, so we see evidence of volcanism, particularly uh, in isotope records. Uh, this is uh, the proto-North Atlantic, uh, and in this shallow seaway over the North American continent, the Western Interior Seaway, uh, these are data from chromium and osmium that suggest uh, a potential input uh, of chromium and osmium through volcanic activity, which might be related to large igneous provinces. Uh, I worked on a, uh, when I was in Oxford, I worked on a core from Iona, from uh, Texas, with sediments deposited uh, in the Western Interior Seaway and generated uh, neodymium isotope uh, records. And this is a compilation of uh, neodymium isotope results uh, during the end of the Cenomanian uh, into the Turonian, so uh, during Oceanic and Oxic Event 2. Uh, and what we see is that uh, at Iona, uh, neodymium isotope ratios changed from minus five to values as high as plus two. Uh, and that's really an outlier compared to other data sets. If we look at most of the proto-North Atlantic data that are available, values are relatively uh, negative of about minus seven. And the same for the values that we have available for further north into the seaway. And this is interesting because this could tell us something about the route that uh, nutrients took through the, through the ocean uh, when they caused uh, this uh, oceanic anoxic event. Because we think that uh, large igneous provinces were responsible for putting nutrients into the system, but we don't know if those nutrients were derived from the Caribbean large igneous province or the high Arctic large igneous province. But the pattern of the data uh, that we find seems to suggest um, is more easily uh, reconcilable with an input of volcanic nutrients from the south, so from the Caribbean large igneous province. Uh, and we think that this may have been uh, the culprit driving oceanic and oxic event too. Uh, to go back to the, to the site southwest of Australia, uh, where we recovered a record of uh, OA2. Um, we saw these uh, black bands in the sediments and they're actually part of a rhythmically bedded sequence. Um, so we're uh, I'm busy interpreting uh, 
the rhythmicity in this record uh, based on time series analysis of, of high resolution XRF data. Um, and this is a close-up again of those sediments. Um, and what's really interesting to me is that um, the anoxic conditions seem to come and go because uh, those bands are separated uh, by oxygenated sediments. Uh, and perhaps they reflect an oscillation in the thickness of the oxygen minimum zone. Um, Site U1516 was relatively deep. And perhaps the oxygen minimum zone at times expanded to also cover site U1516. And the fact that these uh, bands occur in a rhythmic way seems to suggest that this um, perhaps increased stratification of the water column was directly driven by orbital cycles. So that we might be looking at uh, that the, a place where the local oceanography is the, directly controlled by orbital forces. So um, I want to uh, use these different scenarios. So one of them, this abrupt climatic perturbation in the Cretaceous, and the other one, the gradual opening of gateways in the Eocene. I want to use these different scenarios to learn a bit more about what parts of ocean circulation are related uh, to climate and what parts of ocean circulation are completely controlled by geography. Um, and I can't do that. Uh, by only generating neodymium uh, isotope data, I have to uh, integrate my results uh, with modeling studies. And I also want to more and more use other archives, the, the trital archives of neodymium, to really understand where the material is coming from and potentially where the areas of deep water formation are in the world's oceans. Uh, so that is my uh, goal for the coming years uh, to work uh, on those aspects of ocean circulation and climate uh, in past greenhouse climates. Uh, and finally, I want to use this opportunity uh, in case you're not sick of uh, orbital forcing yet and you want to know more about it, um, please uh, consider subscribing to the Cyclostratigraphy newsletter. This is a newsletter that appears once every three months and we've just started it this year. Uh, and it uh, will keep you up to date, hopefully, uh, on all things uh, related to cyclostigraphy. Uh, and also new this year uh, is that we have started a journal dedicated to cyclostigraphy and rhythmic climate change, uh, and we now invite contributions. Um, and the newsletter is hosted on a new website uh, with educational resources, and the website is cyclostigraphy.org. Thank you very much. For your attention and I'd be very happy to uh, to discuss uh, further. All right, thank you for the interesting talk and I just wanted to remind everyone that the chat is now open for your questions. Uh, you could post your questions in the chat and I would read it out. Uh, okay, so I do have a couple of clarifications but before that we do already have a question in the chat and I'll read it to you. So the first question is by uh, Jacko uh, from Wales. And he thanks you for the great talk and it's convincing and clearly narrated. And it's also very useful for teaching students. And his question is, do you think there was any global role of the meteorite impact at the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary? Yes, um, we didn't study the uh, impact of the meteorite impact itself um, in the study at Sumaya. But what we can say is that uh, at the time of the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary, the um, volcanism, the impact of volcanism, uh, we don't really see that at that time. Also, uh, there is no eccentricity maxima, there's actually an eccentricity minima uh, at the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. Uh, so we think that the uh, extinction is actually purely caused by the impact of the asteroid. So yes, we think that there was a global impact uh, that led to one of the biggest mass extinctions in Earth history. So yes, definitely. Uh, okay, so we have the next question from Mohammed Hashim from Western Michigan, USA. He again thanks you for the great talk. And the question is, regarding the mercury data, do you think mercury isotopes can be helpful to understand the source of mercury in terms of volcanic, terrestrial, wildfires, et cetera? 
Yeah, uh, I think more and more people are looking into uh, not just mercury concentrations, but also into mercury isotopes. Um, myself, uh, I really don't know uh, enough about it to comment, but I, I do think it's mm -hmm. very promising uh, and that, that this could be uh, the next step in understanding uh, what is driving the mercury variations that we see in the sediments. Um, yeah. What I also find really interesting is the combination of mercury with other uh, systems. For example, uh, osmium isotope data, uh, and that's because they have a very different uh, way of uh, spreading through the Earth's system. So uh, when we see uh, changes in, in osmium isotopes in the oceans, osmium has a very long residence time, uh, and it really uh, responds to things um, such as these uh, large igneous provinces. When they put uh, osmium with a different signature into the system, we can see that change worldwide. Uh, so the combined application uh, of osmium and mercury can perhaps help us to uh, understand also styles of volcanism uh, better. All right. Uh, okay. All right. So we have another question from Victoria. I'm not sure where she's from. Uh, she also thanks you. And she asked the question, do you think it would be useful to find out the ratios of organic and inorganic limestone sediments in relation to climate change? Yes. Um, so one reason I'm so interested in the Cretaceous Oceanic Anoxic event uh, is because we see very organic rich uh, sedimentation. Mm, and we see that as a result of uh, very widespread anoxia in the water column. And if we look at uh, current climate change, we actually see that the oxygen minimum zones uh, around the world are expanding. <clears throat> and we see the formation of so-called dead zones. So areas where that oxygen minimum zone is uh, uh, touching the, the seafloor and where um, there is no life possible at that uh, water depth uh, in the water column and on the on the seafloor. Um, so I think it's really uh, important to understand, um, in particular, the formation of past organic rich deposits, uh, because I think that would be very relevant uh, for the future if we can understand and perhaps predict uh, oxygen uh, conditions uh, in the world's oceans. Uh, but I'm not sure if that uh, really answered your question uh, regarding the ratio. So if, if you have a follow-up question, please feel free to, to write that in the chat. Uh, okay, so if there is any follow-up question, uh, you could just post it in the chat. Uh, but there's another question now. Uh, so that this is from Teresa from Vienna. And uh, she asks the question uh, for the Wattenberg 2012 paper, how do you exclude that the enrichment, uh, just a second. Uh, okay, uh, how do you exclude that the enrichment or depletion in material that contributes to magnetic susceptibility is not altered or an artifact of diagenetic uh, CaCO3 redistribution? Did you test diagenesis independent proxies, for example, titanium by aluminum ratio as well? Thank you, uh, Teresa. Um, yeah, we definitely uh, see that um, when we look at the limestones and marls at uh, Sumaya, that there is really, um, when you look at the bedding surfaces, that uh, the, the change is quite abrupt. You go from a marl to a limestone. So we think that that could definitely represent uh, the later uh, redistribution of, of calcium carbonate. Um, what we do see, however, is that we see quite uh, pronounced differences in thickness. Um, so we see that uh, the areas that have the, the limestone marl alternations that have the more clay rich marls also are much thicker. And that leads us to suggest that these alternations, that the primary driver of those was the input of clay uh, into the basin, the deposition of uh, the trito clay um, based on those thickness variations. Uh, and there were probably also variations in productivity and then later redistribution of calcium carbonate. But we think that the primary driver is that uh, detrital dilution. Um, 
later, we also analyzed for specific intervals. We, uh, we did uh, analyze XRF. We used XRF to analyze the elemental uh, uh, concentrations. Um, but I have to confess that for most of the data, this hasn't been published yet, except for the uh, aluminium that is in the, in the paper, the Percival paper. Uh, but, but this uh, confirms our, our interpretation. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Uh, so we do have the follow-up question from Victoria. She thanks you for the answer and then asks, do you think the organic limestone can provide insights into how carbon dioxide levels affect marine life productivity? Ah. Um, I have no idea if you could do something with just assessing the amount of limestone deposited. Um, it is very curious that in the Cretaceous uh, and in general, uh, in the Mesozoic, also already in the Jurassic, we see such large scale deposition of uh, carbonate uh, by marine organisms that we, we don't really see uh, after the Cretaceous. Um, but I'm not sure we can use those quantities directly to say something uh, about CO2 and productivity. Um, but I do think we can use tools like um, uh, the foraminifera uh, and also uh, organic geochemistry uh, to say something about uh, CO2 and productivity. Um, but I'm not sure we can really use the amount of limestone itself because I don't think we're really certain what drives such large scale um, changes. Yeah, um, so we can definitely look at the uh, I can see a follow-up question from Victoria. How, how about the fact that global warming slows down shell formation um, because of lower pH? Um, so I think more and more people are looking into the morphology of foraminifera and also of calcareous nanoplankton uh, and are linking this uh, to ocean acidification events. Uh, so I think people are, are looking into that. But not isotopes give us the answer for the uh, rate of productivity if, if we are using the organic limestones. It's still a, a follow-up question from the... No, this is my question, but then I'm just following up on what Victoria said. Can you repeat your question, Shad? Like, uh, can we not use uh, uh, carbon isotopes to uh, constrain the productivity? Yeah, we can use the difference between uh, carbon isotope from uh, planktic species and uh, carbon isotope in benthic species to understand uh, about productivity. Um, but that then we also uh, have to understand uh, the behavior of, of water masses a bit because uh, water masses can also uh, age as they flow through the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I guess yes, but we also need a multi-proxy approach and, and not just, uh, we would depend on a lot of localities. Okay, sure. All right, so she gives you a big thank you in the end. And so I'll go into the next question. So we have a question from Romain. Uh, yeah, Romain from Switzerland. Uh, he compliments you for your presentation. And then he asked, uh, you mentioned that sedimentation during the EOC near Antarctica was mainly driven by eccentricity and obliquity, but how did eccentricity and obliquity affect the fluctuation of sedimentation? Yeah, thank you. That's a, uh, it's a very good question. What exactly is driving these sedimentary patterns? Um, and actually, I, uh, I also have that question for the Campanian site that we looked at, where we see a combined influence of eccentricity and obliquity. Um, when we see eccentricity and precession, uh, we can often interpret that as uh, changes in insulation driving changes in temperature, changes in runoff uh, directly. Um, so it's puzzling me that we don't see the influence of precession so much. Uh, both at this uh, Eocene site uh, and at the uh, Campanian site, and that instead we see such a strong influence of obliquity. Um, for the Eocene site, it was at a relatively high latitude, 
um, so it could be that uh, the site itself was quite sensitive to uh, insulation variations driven by obliquity and that uh, perhaps the, it was also picking up uh, longer scale variations uh, uh, in eccentricity. But what exactly the climatic mechanism is that uh, from the forcing uh, factor in changes in insulation to the sedimentation at the site, whether that is driving uh, variations in productivity, nutrient availability, runoff, uh, is something that uh, I think for this site we don't fully understand yet. All right, All right. Uh, so we have the next question from Mariano from Fairfax USA. And again, he thanks you for the great talk. Um, there is also a great discussion on the diagenetical origin of mal limestone cyclic alterations instead of an orbitally induced signal. What do you think about that? Yeah, uh, thank you, Mariano. This is a question that I, I think is, uh, touches upon what uh, Teresa asked before, that uh, diagenetic effects can have a strong influence uh, on, uh, on the resulting sedimentary sequences, and that some of the things we see may be more of an effect of uh, the later redistribution, for example, of uh, calcium carbonate uh, than a primary signal. Uh, and that is something we always have to carefully evaluate. Um, uh, and I think that uh, uh, Teresa has done some uh, great work on this. Um, I would say that in Zumaya, uh, we learn a lot from looking at the thickness variations um, that uh, tell us that um, when we see marls that are more rich in clay, that they are also thicker. Uh, and this is uh, suggesting to us that this is driven by uh, runoff, uh, uh, bringing clay into the basin, so that, that there is likely a primary uh, variability in carbonate uh, and clay content uh, already present uh, before uh, such diagenetic processes. Um, and what we can also do is look at um, elements that are not directly affected. Uh, by such uh, diagenetic uh, alteration, but I, I, I think you're absolutely right that this is something we have to we have to keep in mind. We always have to carefully evaluate uh, the origin uh, of of cyclic alternations as much as we can. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, all right. So we have one more question in the chat. Uh, by Patrick from Bavaria, Germany. Uh, great talk, thank you very much. Uh, is it possible to distinguish the Chicks Club impact and the Deccan Trap eruption by the isotope data? Um, so um, from a paleoclimate perspective, we are analyzing uh, isotopes to, to study changes in climate and we're trying to uh, date these changes as best as we can. Uh, in, in the case of uh, our study at uh, Thumaya, um, by using the, the psychostratigraphic uh, interpretation of these sediments. Uh, and what we can do with those uh, results is uh, investigate climate changes uh, around this time interval. And we then compare this to uh, reconstructions of volcanism uh, and, uh, uh, and see if there is any coincidence uh, in terms of uh, timing uh, of these events. By looking at the uh, isotopes itself, we see a negative shift directly at the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. Uh, and this is something that could be caused by volcanism or by the impact. It's not um, uh, a unique uh, response of the isotopes. Uh, in this case, the, the carbon isotope system uh, can receive uh, negative inputs from, from both uh, those uh, processes. So just looking at the, the isotopes would not be enough to tell you the cause of the event. Uh, so I don't see any more questions in the chat. Uh, uh, well, uh, can I ask a question if there is still time? It's possible. Are you free? I'd be very happy to take your questions, Shadi. <laughs> 
All right. So this this is just a clarification. Uh, so you did uh, uh, I mean present in I mean in the first half of your slides about the deck and trap, and in there you said that the uh, eruptive ages by the uranium thorium and argon argon ages are different. Yeah. What could be the reason for that? Is there any particular reason, or is it because of an error or? No, I think uh, the analytical power of these techniques is, is very high right now. Um, and their precision uh, has very much improved uh, over recent years. Um, I think uh, what is uh, making direct comparison a bit tricky is where they locate the Cretaceous paleogene boundary um, in the material that they're dating because they're looking at an uh, alternation of uh, lava flows and sediments um, in between. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily so easy to, to pinpoint the boundary. And I think that's where some of the differences might originate. All right, okay. Uh, well, if there are no more questions, I would like to thank you again for the fascinating talk. And uh, before we end, I would just like to remind everyone to join all of us next Wednesday for when we have the next talk by Alvisa Finotelo, who's going to discuss uh, the natural and anthropogenic modifications of the Venice Lagoon to unravel morpho sedimentary evolution of tidal meanders. And see you then. Thank you for joining. <laughs>